We've been in a very exciting series called Prophesy, and it's not been about charismatic tricks. We've not been talking about calling people out uh, to talk about their social security numbers and their bank statements and their addresses. We've been talking about the absolute necessity. I want to rephrase that. The non-negotiable necessity of being people that have eyes that see and ears that hear. Say, yeah. It's a dangerous time to be blind and to not know what the Lord is doing and or saying. Satan loves environments of confusion confusion because it's it's opportune for deception when people are con, uh, confused and don't know what God is saying and what God is doing and what God wants uh, then what happens is the agenda of hell gets to be advanced the prerogative of the wicked one gets pushed through lives and families and stories so when we talk about prophesying it's not just about predicting your future now every religion in the world has a hunger to know tomorrow answers today. We've done a, a lot of that and we'll do some more of that, uh, but the spectrum of hearing from God and, and, and receiving information from God, whether it be by dream or by vision or by uh, encounter with a person, is far more broader and far more urgent than what you and I know. We in America right now are in an unprecedented time of ambiguity. That's just a fanciful way of saying everybody is trying to figure it out. You won't tell the truth. And whether that's marriage or whether that's a career or whether that's where to live or whether that's, if you're honest, who to trust, whether that's who to rely on, who to confide in, we're all uh, been forced into a very hard reset in trying to figure out and regather ourselves. But it's dangerous, Lawrence, to try to regather yourself without need for revelation. If you try to regather yourself in logic and in fact, and we gather yourself even on tradition based upon the way things used to be. The real truth is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has to embrace the fact that the world we knew is no more. The way we knew is no more. The approach we had is no more. And so when what was no longer is, we've got to put our ear not just to the mind of God, but to his heart to figure out what he's doing and what he wants and how to cooperate with his scream, yeah. And so when I teach on prophecy and prophesying, I'm not just getting on Clubhouse and Facebook Live and, and, and teaching people prophecy tricks. I'm disinterested in that. I did that as a teenager. At this particular place, what I'm trying to do is give people access to the seven spirits of God. You need the spirit of wisdom and revelation and in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that your destiny is not aborted because contrary to popular belief, you can live and die and not fulfill your destiny. That is, that is existing death. It's walking death. If you are disinterested in figuring out who you are and why you are, you are a zombie already. So we need to put our pulse on the heart of God. And this morning... I have to visit a very uncomfortable place, Ricky, in the scriptures. <laughs> and this is one of those words that I'm not very excited about. I'm not amped up about it, but I know you need it. And I know the body of Christ needs it. And this is not something, Diamonique, beautiful shoes, that I designed with homiletic or hermeneutic intent. This is the word of the Lord for, the, for America right now, particularly the church in America. So those that know the voice of the Lord will hear his heart in this, and it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Journey with me, so journey, if you will, to 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. 2 Samuel, chapter 12, in the NIV version. I'm going to talk about, hey, Elder Deborah, good to see you, lady. I'm going to talk about a realm of prophetic life, prophetic culture that nobody wants to talk about. N nobody ever wants to talk about this. I you'll see why in a minute. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1, and I'll read until I'm ready to stop. Are you there? We're in the NIV version. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew it up with his children and shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arm. It was like a daughter to him. 
Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan the prophet, as surely as the Lord lives, that man who did this has got to die. He's got to pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a wicked thing. It even had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you're that man. And, and this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives to your arms. I gave you all Israel and all Judah. And if, uh, and if all this had been too little, I would have even given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You took his wife for your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite for your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Keep reading. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. He will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but this thing I'm going to do in broad daylight. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will. And after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted. And spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood behind him to get up from the ground. But he refused and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him the child was dead. For they thought while the child was still living he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How could we now tell him the child is dead? He may, he may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves. And he realized the child was dead. He asked, is the child dead? Yes, they replied. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotion, changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord, look at this here, and worshipped. Then he went into his own house, and they requested for him to eat. Father, this word is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of this message this morning for the sake of note-taking and deliberation and discussion is, I Stand Corrected. Elder BJ, I'm going to need you real strong through here uh, because what we, what we do is, is, is we skip over the white elephant in the room. Um, the word of God is the most powerful provision on planet earth. For us, it is more important than bread and water, oxygen and air. The word of God is, is the very rudimentary strategy that upholds all of creation. The, the reason you're able right now to sit and gravity is not lifting you up off your chair is because it has a rule enacted by the word of God. You know, one of the things I love about it is God spoke to the universe one time, never had to repeat itself, and it's still obeying to this day. The sun is still coming up. The moon is still coming up. Stars are still singing and obeying because that's how powerful the word of God is. But when you're dealing with the word of God, you're dealing with concepts, idioms, uh, uh, technologies, phrases that if we're honest, don't look at me in that tone of voice, many of us like to avoid. We like inspiration. <laughs> we love encouragement. Many of us are even okay with the phrase instruction. But the Bible says, Richard, all scripture is God breathed and, and, and inspired. Here is where my problem comes in for reproof. <laughs> the first, I know you're quiet. The first, the first experience when you enter the word of God come on through here is reproof that that's a word we don't spend a lot of time studying we like joy and peace 
We love grace. We don't understand that one of the reasons we need to go to the scriptures is not just for knowledge preaching and grow. It's for reproof. And what I mean by that is we've not really been trained on how to go to the scriptures to get corrected. A lot of us go to, I know, I feel you. We go to the scriptures for agreement, for inspiration, for understanding. Very few people in the earth go to the scriptures to find out how wrong they are. I don't know a lot of people that go to the scriptures to find out where they're out of order. I don't know a lot of people, I know you want me to turn my plow already, that go to the word of God to have the word of God become the litmus test and the measuring watt and the mirror by which they view not their neighbor but themselves. So in my investigation of this, if the, one of the ministries of the scripture is reproof, then there's some other concepts that we've got to have some honest conversation about. Inhale. Except if we're dealing with reproof, we got to deal with rebuke. Lord, help me today. And if we're dealing with rebuke, we got to deal with a different word, Pastor Shaman, which is chastisement. Lord, they so quiet today. And if we're dealing with chastisement, we've also got to deal with the concept of discipline. When you're dealing with prophetic life, prophetic culture, prophetic ministry, we have been trapped in edification, exhortation, and comfort. But I've got way too much Bible for uncomfortable prophetic moments. For me to believe that when God talks, he's always trying to make you feel better. My Bible tells me that sometime he started talking and it dragged you all the way out of your opinion and all the way out of your comfort zone and all the way out of your character and all the way out of your network and all the way out of your desire. So what do you do when you get corrected? My, my passage of scripture is extremely significant because a part of what it shows is God's development to the making of kings. Scream, yeah. He, kings in the Bible were not necessarily born. They were made. They, they had to go through certain processes and had to meet certain people, endure certain training. They had to understand certain things agriculturally, you know, droughts and famine and plenty and soldiers and armies. Being groomed to be a king was more than just a monarchical position in Israel. Say, so yeah, uh, a part of what it meant is that you will be entrusted with influence. As a king, you would be responsible for establishing the law of the land. You would also become somebody, listen, whose life determined how other people decide. If I am a king in Israel, then families are watching me, the stories are watching me, and what I do makes it okay. You don't like that, do you? Because a lot of us want influence sometime, but we don't want the consequence of it or, or the measuring rod of it. When God starts dealing with us like we are who we are, it gets complicated, Ross. And so what happens is very many people, particularly in this generation, they want to use influence for their purposes, but they don't like living up to the level. Anybody in the room going to stop lying? I say, sometime I don't like my level. <laughs> yeah, I know it's quiet. Because every now and then you want to smack them back. You know, every now and then you want to be able to, 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 to lay hands in a different way. You, you want to be able to speak, Jordan, in a different kind of tongue. But there's a level in you that, that gives you, I know it's uncomfortable, it gives you a restraint. And that in many moments is difficult to explain. And, and the reason this passage of scripture it's so beautiful is because it's dealing with everybody's favorite person, King David, the lover of God, a prophet in his own right, the recipient of several declarations of destiny about who he would be and how he would go. This is King David. And sometimes when you're in, here we go. You ready? 
when you're in manifestation, life is starting to look like what it was supposed to look like. What you got to watch for is complacency. Because it seems like you've done everything you need to do to be where you're supposed to be. And when you get too comfortable, you start to relax around areas of conviction. I love your word. And you end up moving into intoxication with your own effort and your own ability and your own prowess. And you end up being found where you should not be found. The reason we got here is because in this chronicling of this particular story, it was a season. Scream season. Shout season. I'm going to challenge you and consider to evaluate in your own life if maybe your, se- your, your, your sin cycles is because of your ignorance of the season. When you know what time it is, you behave differently. D- David, David was so comfortable that he lost sight of season. And when he lost sight of season, here came sin. When you don't have reverence around what God is trying to do now, you start to commit to coping mechanisms and you get comfortable. He got comfortable. You know the story. He looked up on, on, on the balcony and said, Girl, all that wagon you dragging. <laughs> she was thicker than a snicker. But in order to achieve that, I want you to hear why this is powerful. He had to do something before lust. The, the, the scriptures say, can I connect this? When lust is conceived. You're by, this is not the Stevenson translation. And if lust can be conceived, it means it is a seed. When lust has been conceived, then the Bible says, and brought forth, it brings forth death. So at some point, if I've got an irregulated lust, don't lock up there, something is going to die. Whether at my hands or on the behavior of my irresponsibility, something will happen. And so it makes perfect sense. And because something was alive in David that probably came from his rejection of his father Jesse, he started to intoxicate himself with power, ability. Very much after the 23rd Psalms, he went into a who gonna check me boo spirit. You know, when people start singing your praise, sometimes you join them. He, Saul has slain his thousands. That's what they sang. It got a Grammy. They went to the Stellar Awards with pretty fanciful sequence robes. The choir director did back bends and was twerking and did the soprano alto tenor trick and said, but David has slain his ten thousands. And David said, you're right, I did. I'm that guy. Yeah, I, you're right. Maybe I am. Yeah, because remember the lion? Remember the bear? That was your boy. And, and in all of that confidence in his own ability made him more comfortable in his life. And he started to lose his conviction. And so what happened was after he did what he did, he had to kill a man to get a woman that the real truth is, had he just waited a couple of years, he'd have had her anyway. So you got this ravenous desire to hurry up and get, hurry up and be, hurry up and have. One day, we get to 2 Samuel 20, and here come Mr. Nathan. (laughs) Now, what blesses me, they both prophets. It it profiles for us that you ain't the only one that see. It it, it profiles for us that every seer needs a seer, and every prophet needs a prophet. And just because you discern and detect and sense don't mean you are infallible. I don't know why you prophetic people think that you are the fourth member of the Godhead and that if God's going to do something, he's going to show you first. Nathan went to David. Could God have come to David himself? Yeah! We got all kinds of 
the songs where they was lullabying and singing and hugging, but there was one area that David would not hear God on. It was his flesh. Sometimes when you are a gifted person, you have no problem with discerning their flesh and their issue and their problem. I sense a little rejection, a little spirit on you. We love diagnostics and diagnosis. You know, that church I've had experiences there. Shut up! Because even though you see, you're still blind. And, and you're blind not necessarily about other people. Can I preach heavy? You're probably most blind about you. And the danger with that is the way you're blind about you will be projected on what you put on other people. Your issue with me is your business. <laughs> it ain't got nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with how you see. But, but what happens, Rail, when you sing and can't see? Pray and can't see. Write and can't see. David did all of that, studied, and just did not realize the level of wickedness that was growing inside of him, what it would cost the nation. I'm going to break this down to you pragmatically, but I want to theorize this so you get the full concept of the story. This is a very dangerous thing because now the situation is you got a guy that knows God, scream yeah, yeah. that worships God, say yeah. yeah, that loves him and dances and shouts and all of this, who's got to be corrected. The, 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 the silence in the room proves that you may have bought into the same false prophetic propaganda that all we do is bless. And did I, if I come to you with the prophetic word that corrects you and it don't agree with your spirit, what you're really saying is my soul didn't like this. Because correction, watch me, is not for the spirit. They won't help me today. Correction is for the soul. And because we spend so much time ignoring the status of the soul when something don't feel right, we push it off. I did my studies to validate this, and you know what I found out? There's a whole scriptural panorama doctrine on the holy ministry of correction. Uh, yeah, 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 I feel the anointing. There's a whole line of contiguous thought from Genesis to Revelation about the lengths God would go to to correct a people. And the whole reason why you need Jesus was because Israel refused to be corrected. The reason a Messiah needed to come was because they wanted inspiration and they wanted validation and they wanted encouragement. But don't tell me I'm wrong. Israel couldn't handle it. So Nathan was a prophet of God. He's actually one of my favorite because he wasn't flamboyant. He wasn't showy. <laughs> He, he wasn't one of those that were putting their cash app on their Facebook lives to give people these watery prophecies that mean nothing. He, he wasn't trying to have conferences uh, poorly attended and poorly publicized, using clip art flyers to get people to come to them off the backs of the church they tried to divide when they left. He wasn't doing any of that. He was just worshiping. <laughs> and uh, he, he received word from the Lord, and he did a principle here. It's going to make sense to the moment. He said, okay, this is the king. This means if I have a word for him, I'm going to break this down for you so that you can have it in P principles. If I'm going to deliver this to him, I can't come at him in my flesh because I'm dealing with a flesh issue. How many of you know people who say they're prophetic that want to confront people in the flesh, in the flesh? You just as wicked as it. if you're walking up like, I, yeah, I know, you, you, you cannot confront carnality in carnality. If any one of you be overtaken in a fault, I know you want me to turn my plow. Those that are spiritual, it takes the spirit to overpower the work of the flesh. And if you're in yours, you can't bring me out of mine. 
And what I mean by that is this is a seasoned prophetic principle, which means the most powerful prophetic ministers don't like when they've got to rebuke. They don't get excited when they've got to get judged. You think I sit at home rocking like, ooh, I can't wait to warn your people. No. Real prophetic people, can I preach like a real prophetic people? Cry when they've got to warn. They, they weep when they've got to tell people destruction is coming. They, they're burdened. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm that old type of prophet where, where, where I can't sleep when I've got to deliver something heavy. The hand of the Lord. Now, I don't, you new school people that walk around and put blindfolds on in 30 minutes and just walk around just shooting random stuff to people, I worry for you because you're playing with something holy. Here's what brings me to my next point. Rebuke is holy. They don't want to hear me, Derek. I, I said it's holy. We don't treat it like it's holy anymore. And the worst part is we're willing to do it for amens. You don't correct people for you better say that. That ain't the point. If it didn't change you. If it didn't rearrange you, refocus you, I didn't do what I wanted to do. And so Nathan's mentality in our text was, I'm going to get out of the way because the message means more than my personality. I have no agenda. I have no goal. I have no brand. I don't want you to know how accurate I am. I want to grab a hold of a heart that's about to turn in a dangerous direction. And because you're the king, if your heart don't turn, the nation has come to ruin. So Nathan... Walks up to work. And he says, hey, king. You saw that new story on Netflix? It's about a rich guy who took advantage of a poor guy, and it was so criminal. It was crazy. And David said, no, I'm going to have to binge watch that. <laughs> and Nathan said, yeah, it was crazy. Got a lot of reviews. And, and the way it ended was so bad because this guy with power and influence and ability and range and reach, and he took advantage of somebody powerless. And David said, Oh, no, couldn't have been me. And Nathan said, Yes, yeah, it's you. He presented this prophetic word in parabolic form because here's the problem. When you're about to move in correction, the first thing that stands up in an unrepented heart is deflection. I'm working in here. A, a part of what that means is if I say you are out of order, and the first thing that rises up in your soul, but you, but they, but I ain't, oh, we're not talking about everybody else. We're dealing with you. Nathan was so wise that he wanted to go ahead and deal with that monster of deflection. He dealt with it and disarmed the king. Because many of us can understand how it applies to other people. But we make our circumstances unique. Because if I act like you don't understand, I have license and I have right to do whatever I want to do. And I get to move the anointing of correction away from me. But rebuke is holy. You can't be a worshiper and a praiser and not have the heart ready for correction. I'll prove it. So, um, so he gives them this story. And what I love about this text, Darrell, we hate studying this. Every school of the prophets needs this one, actually. David shut up the entire time. He said nothing until the man was done talking. How many of us sense correction coming and want to argue. Ricky, can I rent an amen from somewhere? Call Scripture Reveals. We sense it coming and we're like, and we start to develop reasons and rationale and debates and deflection about why I can't be corrected. He shut up. And then he came to sobriety. I've got some principles that's going to help you this week. And the reason I know, Jordan, that David came to sobriety was this. Here's what the most powerful king in Israel's history said to somebody that worked for him. Nathan was on staff. He ran the minstrels. 
David lifted his hands before Nathan and said, I stand corrected. I've sinned against the Lord. He had no fight in him. There's some deeper wisdom there. Because it shows that David's acquaintance with the presence of the Lord dealt with him in such a way where he could handle the power of correction in the soul. Because again, correction is not for the spirit man. It's for the soul parts of you. So what happened during this prophetic word? I'm going to just walk you through it so you can apply it to your life. Before I do that, I want you to realize this just so that you can study if you don't believe me. This makes so much sense, Richard, because in all of my studies, the most of the scriptures about correction came from Solomon. What did I just teach you? If your daddy is a dummy, you don't be one too. Solomon must have learned some stuff. Now he had his own level of stupid. Any man that wants hundreds of wives is an idiot. So he had his own level of stupid, but he had an understanding of the value of correction. So much so, y'all not going to like this, but I got to give it to you. He says stuff like, if you spare the rod from the back of your son, you hate him. Solomon wrote that. He said, if you apply the rod of correction to a pool, they'll attack you. There's literally dozens of scriptures on the ministry of correction in the life of the son of a man who received it. If you receive it in you, wisdom goes on your children. Ask me why. Correction is a manifestation of the spirit of wisdom. We in this generation, we love the spirit of knowledge. And the reason why we want knowledge is because it puffeth up. I don't mind knowing a lot of stuff because if I know a lot of stuff, it makes me better than you. I get to brag and boast on my intellect and my knowledge and my statistics because I know my Bible. I know these statistics. I know this language. But wisdom does something different from knowledge. Knowledge ain't got nothing to do with the future. Wisdom is applied to where you ain't been yet. This, this is why correction is a manifestation of the spirit of wisdom you ask God to make you wise he's going to send something to correct you you start crying out for wisdom in an area you will be confronted with where you're not right now that's different from knowledge it's wisdom so then if the Bible is right and we're dealing with issues like reproof, rebuke, which means, take a deep breath. The word rebuke, I know y'all Pentecostals love to use it like it means slap. I rebuke you, pop like. But the word rebuke literally means to halt suddenly, to stop. Why are you rebuking the devil? And you can't be rebuked. Why is it abuse when you're rebuked, but it's warfare when you send it to Satan? Why is it, take a deep breath, guys. I'm on assignment. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why is it church hurt when you're rebuked, but it's intercessory prayer and growling and moaning when you're tearing Jezebel up every week? The problem is, which is God's greatest grievance, I think, right now, our hunger for wisdom has decreased over the years. Our hunger for entertainment and access and money and, and status is increasing. Even our in, uh, hunger for supernatural stuff, because we love some good sage. I'm a Virgo! Pisces! Sagittarius, Leo, Cancer. I'm everything but humble. You can't tell me nothing. Unfortunately, I preach and teach and prophesy in a generation that knows everything. So they have no hunger for wisdom. 
And so because they have no hunger for wisdom, they reject it when it comes. I want to highlight this, and I'm going to break this down. I promise you we'll be on time. The most powerful part of this story is at the beginning and the end of the text. One day you're going to be powerful in the scriptures, Diamonique. Your, your cry for knowledge in the word of God has not gone unheard. He heard you tell him you want to love his word and hide it in your heart. He's going to give you what you desire, but you will be hated for it. You will be scorned for it. You in a generation that will never understand why a woman would lay her life down for the will of God. But you've been called to be one of the hardest things any woman of God can be, an example. Live in it. Anyway, um, the first part of this story wears me out, E.P. Teresa. It, 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 it completely strikes me down, and it's simple. <laughs> and I took classes in philosophy, Greek. I took statistics. I did. This one verse in the opening of my text brought me to my knees. Apostle Torn, I love you. He said this, the Lord, watch me, this is verse 1, the Lord, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Here we go. You mean to tell me all relationships ain't created equal? You mean to tell me that there are people that God's going to send to me? You mean to tell me that there's somebody that's a sign to tell me when I'm off? The Lord sent him. Good God from Zion. The Lord sent him. Nathan didn't wake up and have some Wheaties and some grits and say, I ain't got nothing else to do today. I'm going to David. The Bible says the Lord sent him. Be very careful because I know y'all think that everybody's replaceable. It is not true. It's a sociological, psychological, pathological lie. Some relationships you lose, you'll never get another one like that because they are relationships that have been sent by God. And certainly you've got mercy and you've got grace, but when you, watch me, when you break a prophetic relationship, that means when God resurrects a voice or a word or a friend or a partner to come alongside, here we go, what he's doing in you. Because every friend ain't social. Some friend is coming alongside of what God's trying to accomplish in you. And you need more purpose partners than you do club partners. You need more purpose partners and prophetic partners than you do folk to go out with in the movie. I want to know if you are in position. For people that's been sent by God. And, and I love this, Rachel, because it means that when we talk about the provision of God, we like to talk about car notes. And we love to talk about graham crackers and applesauce and Section 8 vouchers. But one of the most powerful provisions of God is a prophetic relationship. And what that looks like is based upon what I'm getting ready to do in you, I'm going to send you some seer support. Some intercessory companionship. I'm going to send you some men and women around you to help you bear the burden of your identity and who you are and what I want under you. Because you'll be crushed if I don't send Nathan to you. That, that's my favorite part. The other part that I love about this is a scary part, Rachel. Nathan said, hey. Conviction has occurred. You've received this correction. It's hit you where it was supposed to. And you won't die. David said, whoo-wee. But your son will. What are you expressing? What I'm saying is depending upon where you are in your heart, repentance from the sin don't always reverse the consequence. Some of you are living in what you're living in as a matter of consequence. We think that consequence is punishment, but consequence is accountability. And there's a lot of people trying to bind and reverse consequences of sin that's legitimately been forgiven. You ain't going to hell. You just going to live hard. 
because of what you won't do uh, and what you won't hear. Because not only do we need ears that hear, when we're dealing with correction, we're dealing with a hearing heart. And when you have a hearing heart, there are certain things you vow to never go back to. I don't know who I'm talking to. I think there are some people watching me that's like, yo, I'm not stupid. My mom ain't raised no fool. Like a dog uh, that refuses uh, to go back to his vomit, Pookie can stay where he is. Nene can stay where he is. Crack can stay where it is because I'd rather live in Christ than my consequences. Correction is directly related to consequence. He had a consequence that he couldn't do nothing about. Here's where I could lose myself. Say, I stand corrected. Rather than fall corrected, he stood corrected. I, I have some basis for you, but rather than fall corrected, again, we don't like this part of the prophetic ministry, but rather than fall corrected, when I say fall corrected, I mean be offended by the correction. Rather than fall corrected, he stood corrected. Here's why. He was fasting. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Right now. Say, my baby, we prophesied the wind and a wave. Bring the breath back in them. Tell Bathsheba to shut up, Lord. Heal you. Wrapped himself in oil and sackcloth. Heal And the boy died. And I don't think he died as a judgment. It was a consequence. You know why? When you lose something you love, it keeps you away from that area ever again. Notice David never again fell into that type of sin. He died in honor because that loss became a boundary. Some of you have lost stuff. Not because God was mad at you. But because this is the only way you would let him lead you is by loss. And when you are the type of person that can only be led by loss, you don't really understand love. So instead of standing corrected, you fall. You get corrected and get offended. David gives us a powerful lesson. I'm almost at my meat. Elder Cheryl, this will bless you. If you really study this, John, John, it'll change your life. What I'm teaching you today is going to be one of the most important things you'll ever hear. Because if you can't be corrected, you can never be trusted. And if you cannot be trusted, you cannot be promoted. There's so many people in the church that want to be promoted and can't stand being corrected. Prophet Vicky, the boy dies. Oh, his armor bearers come and say, hey, king, I don't know what Nathan said to you, but he's gone. David did something that I don't know if I would have had the emotional fortitude to do. He did something that is opposite of a normal human being. He left what felt natural and did what felt uncomfortable. The Bible say he went to the house of the Lord. I, I'm not going to run. I'm going to be okay today. And he worshiped. Do you know what that means? He found a way to submit even though he was in pain. He found a way to submit even though he was hurt. He found a way to submit. How many of you get corrected and then worship? Hmm. I know people that get corrected and block, get corrected and stop, get corrected and leave. My Bible says when you are a man after God's own heart, when you get corrected, the right response is to lift your hands. Yes, Lord. Because if you would have left me, to, uh oh, if you would have left me to myself, if you would have left me to how I was thinking and the way I was going, and even if you left me to what I thought I wanted, I don't know where the hell I would be. But because you corrected me, you deserve worship. You deserve worship. Because you stopped me in my tracks. Rebuke means to halt. I was on my way somewhere and you said, no, not today. Stop. You gave me reproof. I opened the scripture. Not to find them, but to find me. And I found out I wasn't where I thought I was because I have a heart that receives correction. All right. Here, here is the science of it. Because if this bores you, I've got to give you something pretty. Hmm. 
First of all, Nathan, his word, that prophetic moment, scream prophesy. It had nothing to do with the man and everything to do with the plan. You see, what Nathan did, Lily, and they won't talk. You're a teacher. You're going to spend hours in the word of God. Your assignment in the earth is to break ignorance off our entire generation. And not ignorance of information, but the knowledge of Jesus. You will see him like John saw him. You will experience the wound in his side. And you will find favor with more agnostics than the majority of the people in the church will ever meet. You are Lady Grace. Where was I? Um, yeah, it was the plan. What Nathan did, Pastor Josh, was make sure that David wasn't in the way of Jesus. You see, if the Messiah was coming out, he was the root and the offspring of Jesse, of the Lind of David. That was destiny. Had nothing to do with David's uh, parts. Sorry. And everything to do with the plan. And because he was just a piece of the puzzle, he had to have a prophetic word to make sure that what he wanted in his flesh didn't get in the way of what was supposed to be born from his future. If Nathan hadn't got up that morning and went to David, you'd have no Jesus to call. Because it was that correction that came to number one, the plan. Say the plan. Open your mouth. Say the plan. When God corrects me, he's dealing with the plan. When God rebukes me, he's dealing with the plan. Now, your proud self don't want to receive that because you think you know the plan. And you think you got the plan. But can I prophesy and tell you God's got more plans than what he's told you right now. There are things that God wants to do with your life and story and narrative that you never even dream. You can't fathom what he's doing in your life. I have not seen, ear hath not heard what God hath prepared. Woohoo! For those that love him, there is a plan. So when God sends correction to you, the first thing he's hidden is the plan slash purpose. I walk up to you and say, the Lord tells me to warn you about this. I'm not talking to your personality. I'm talking to your purpose first. Which brings me to a connection. If I don't like correction, it's because I don't understand my purpose. The people that value correction value purpose. Because to value correction is to want to protect purpose at all costs. Lift your hands and say, yeah. Second thing God is doing when he deals with you in a corrective manner, he's now got to deal with the person. Here's why. If I'm sending my word to confront the purpose slash plan, the only thing after that, the immediate reaction, is to let the per person or personality start to dictate how I feel about what was just stated to me. You don't understand. Hey, China, it's, it's like this. I'm the type of person... So the word comes first to purpose, then it comes to the person, then it comes to the position. Burkina, we weren't dealing with an armor bearer or a janitor or a shoe salesman. We're dealing with the king of Israel. We're dealing with the womb by which the Messiah would be born. I, you cannot crave a certain level of position, even if it's beyond your control. If you were born for it, deal with it. Because if this is your position, take a deep breath, your position will always determine your level of correction. Based upon how you call to reign and how you call to serve, that will determine how corrected you're going to be. Why? Because to allow you to go uncorrected is to put more people at risk. If somebody is only responsible for them, they for no more, then they can get away with a lot more than you. And you talking about millions and billions and trivials and shaking the room and all that, you're going to get corrected because of what you're responsible for. So he's going to deal with the purpose, say yeah. yeah. He's going to deal with the person, say yeah. yeah. He's going to deal with the position, say yeah. yeah. And then he's going to deal with the potential. You see, even though the correction comes to you in a current situation, a current moment, a current decision, it really is in protection of what's possible in you. 
what it means is that it becomes a safeguard, a, 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 a protection off the you you've yet to meet yet. So the real truth is y'all don't like correction because you've been through these ignorant religious organizations that love to humiliate people. That's why you get all squirmish when I use the word rebuke. And I use correction because you're like, I ain't got, I ain't got, I ain't got time. You get all weird and wormy. It's because you've been abused. But in my life, hallelujah, rebuke is only upgraded. If rebuke is used to reduce you, it was not rebuke. I don't correct you to make you feel less human. I correct you to convict you about not living up to your potential. That's the difference. That's the difference. Church people, unfortunately, love. And you know what's funny? I've seen people rebuke people for stuff that they do. They don't want to help me. We know those kinds of movements and churches, and we hear those stories. But preachers got kids all over America. And then we'll dehumanize a woman for getting pregnant out of wedlock and put her in front of the church and make her apologize to these iniquitous bastards who are not submitted to the testament of the Lord Jesus Christ and then expose them to judgment. I was there too. I understand what it is to have somebody that's reeks of liquor and, and marijuana and come up to the altar if they're drunk or not because I don't know why y'all think the Holy Ghost is not more powerful than marijuana or that the Holy Ghost is not more powerful than crack. I've seen the Spirit of God come on people and knock them clean out of their high. So I don't care how you come in. The Bible says if any man, they won't help me. If any man come to me, I will in no wise cast him away. But I saw with my eyes people come up. And somehow we made it a political process. Them ninjins, ninjins. If you came up and you looked weird or like you off the streets, in my background, they would say, all right, are you coming by letter or Christian experience? I'm so confused. And, and then Apostle Yolanda, I love you, baby, they, they would say, all right, can I get a motion? Look at how stupid this stuff is. We're dealing with a soul broken, heard the message of the gospel and wants to come and try life change. And all of a sudden we're in a board meeting in front of the whole church. It's witchcraft. Ask me why. Ain't none of you ninjas died on nobody's cross. You shed no blood. You beat no devils. You did not tear the veil. Who do you think you are? Paul said it this way. If not for the grace of God, there go I. I am you. So I'm not going to vote because <laughs> I'm one test from looking like you. I'm one trial from reacting like you. I'm one disappointment from smoking what you smoke. I'm one wound away from going where you went. I'm one stress amount from the strip club. So I'm not going to judge you because I am you. That type of gospel is too good for religious people to hear, which is why their attempts at correction don't work. So it protects the potential. What's amazing, though, Jordan, is the last thing he addressed was the problem. In our approach to correction, the problem is first, the person is last. In the biblical process of correction, which is a manifestation of the spirit of wisdom, the purpose precedes the person. I'm going to deal with you because this is not you. And, and then I'm going to show you how this is impacting your potential. And then I'm going to deal with the parts of your per personality that I just irritated. And then I'm going to deal with the problem. Because you don't have ears to hear about the problem before I have addressed your relationship with the purpose. David, you're king. You're king. I, I, I know you want to just be David sometimes. And I know you, you go to family reunions and you Jesse's son, but when they go to sleep, you're king. <laughs> you and I have relationship and intimacy of an unprecedented nature. I show you parts of me. 
And when I show you parts of me, I hold you accountable to what you see. You're king. So many of us have a hard exterior to correction because we still haven't resolved you're king. And if anybody can initiate, authorize, legalize iniquity in a nation, in a family, it's whoever's reigning. If you're the one the Lord pulled out, if you were the one the Lord chose, if you were the one the Lord anointed, and David loved that. Remember he was dancing? Yeah, laugh because the Lord uh, moved Saul out of the way and now it's me. That wasn't going to always feel good. When the dancing stopped, the decisions had to be made. But the decisions couldn't be made without somebody walking in the spirit of wisdom. Say, hey, last night I had a dream about you. <laughs> and you were behaving beneath you. Acting beneath you. Living beneath you. Now, I'm going to tell you, Rachel, why this becomes weird. Correction is not always about sin. It's about that that is unfeasible for where you're going. So you can be behaving in a certain way and it not necessarily be sin, but it's wrong for you. That becomes weird because you're looking at Nene, Bonquisha, Marcus and Edward, and you're like, yo, they get away with all this. Ain't nothing. Maybe I'm too, I'm doing, I'm deep. No, you're king. And they ain't. And until you resolve that, you'll have no appetite for wisdom. The next time God sends a prophetic moment, whether it's in prayer, whether it's through a personal word, whether it's through a leader, Read this through the scriptures, and you feel corrected. Pastor Scales, the right response is to worship. That's what David did. He didn't send a letter. <laughs> he didn't go silent, because there's a lot of people that manipulate you through silence. You tell them they're wrong, and they just decide to become unresponsive or not available. That's how church people do. It's their way of letting you know in a passive, aggressive, dysfunctional way. With me, I can only handle so many doses of dysfunction. I'm in a people business, so when you realize how dysfunctional people are, it's like, why don't you realize that people don't get rewarded by correcting you? You think we have nothing more to do? Laundry needs to be done. Kids need to go to school. Dogs need to be walked. You think I've got time to just randomly pick up the phone and say, you're wrong, and I mark it off my list. Whew, done for today. Brings me no joy. I'd actually rather not. But the love of God constrains people and won't give rest to those that carry wisdom for where you are. That's the unfortunate part. Because when, when, when God sends Nathan to you, if Nathan decides, I got something better to do, uh, the first 48 comes on tonight, or I don't want to miss my episode, what happens is, let me give you an alternate scripture scenario. Had God spoke to Nathan, Nathan said, eh, then God, in his love for David, would have touched the pillow of Nathan to make sure he was restless. Some of you can't sleep on purpose. Some of you are tired for a reason. Stressed for a reason. It ain't the devil. It's your disobedience. When God gives you something to do and you delay, deny, don't want to do it, he ain't going to put his hand on your head. He's going to touch that pillow. When you undistracted by your lonesome, I'm going to start talking to you. Well, I didn't hear anything. No, yeah, you did. It's called the dealings of God. And sometimes the dealings of God is not a sentence. It's a disturbance. You'd be like, oh, I can't go to sleep. Let me get some wine, some melatonin, some NyQuil, something. And God is like, no. You know why? Wisdom will wake you up. You want to know what the real woke movement is? It's those that cry for wisdom. I don't want to marry without it. I don't want to start a business without it. I don't want to be a husband, a mother, a father, or nothing without the wisdom of God. And God told me, 
son, I'm glad you feel better. I said, hey, man, yeah, yeah. I told him that, Derek. I, I was like, I'm back in the ring, Lord. Jesus, 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 you know. He said, good. You ready to prophesy again? I was like, oh, piss cake. Tell my people revival is coming. I was like, oh, here we go. Time. But then he told me this. But you need to tell my people they made revival signs and wonders. I never said revival was healing. I said revival was repentance. And what America does not want to hear is that the new revival coming on America in 2021 is a revival of repentance. And I know you don't want to hear that because we ain't seen it in a long time. We despise it. We don't like it. The devil has taken the taste out of our mouth for changed hearts. But the next outpouring of the spirit ain't going to be fingers, nose, and toes. It's going to be repentance. And not just from sin. From hard hearts, from defiant wills, from the rejection of destiny. You know, I realized this in prayer. We prayed about a lot of stuff concerning 2020. We bound a lot of stuff. I mean, I, there were nights I was on my face buying Ebola and E. coli and SARS and one night I got real spiritual to Candace and I said, let me try this charismatic stuff. Let me see how y'all do it. I bind COVID-1. I bind COVID-2. I bind COVID-3. I bind COVID-4. I bind COVID-5, 6, and 7. I went all the way up to 19. We prayed about a lot. I don't know very many people that were asking God, especially in 2021, Lord, whatever we came in agreement with because of our pain last year, Whatever we started talking to because of our pain last year. Whatever we went to to cope and to numb ourselves because we didn't know when. Whatever addiction we resuscitated because we didn't trust you enough. We repent. You know, I've studied the prophetic all my life. And you know, I forgot. <laughs> One of the fruit of a real prophetic word is repentance got to change so I believe my assignment with this ever grim this morning is to call for a people that will stand corrected a brand new yes Lord what's crazy is this what I know about proud people is that the Lord won't send somebody more powerful than them to correct them. I'll show you a mystery. M many proud people are in deception right now because they didn't like the source of the correction. You're younger than me. You don't know as much as me. But then, you be Peter. And you're a leader. You've been trained, but you're disloyal. You've got a commitment issue that means you cannot be fully trusted. You are anointed! But something needs to be closed in that character. Jesus refused to die until he corrected Peter. Did you notice that? He immediately could have died, but he prioritized correcting Peter, or else he couldn't have entrusted his church with him. Peter, who has the keys to the doggone kingdom, Peter. But he couldn't unlock a thing before his heart changed. So what Jesus does is this. He arranges. He sends like he sent Nathan to David. He sent a little girl. Because Peter probably would have not received it from one of his peers. You know how we are. Little girl walks out. You know kids can be bad. Can I play with your iPhone? Can I see your iPad? I want to play Roblox. This girl walked up to the apostle, the successor. The successor has to value correction. When you're next, you have to have an appetite for it. This little girl said, what's your favorite color? 
Peter's like, get the heck out of my face. I don't know what I believe right now. I don't know what I think right now. I don't know who I trust. Oh, I know who you are. Has some boogers hanging out her nose. Ain't nothing like a snotty-nosed kid irritating you. I saw you. Peter looks at the girl like, get out of my face. Where your mama? You was with Jesus the other day. And Peter said, no, I wasn't. Lied. He immediately lied. He was a leader and lied. The successor and lied. The keys to the kingdom holder and lied. And it wasn't Jesus he was mad at. It was his call. You gone. I, I know I can be you when I feel you. <laughs> I know I can obey you when you're around me. But now you embarrass me by calling me. You alienated me. No, you, yeah. Shanquisha looked at him and said, I know you him. And the Bible say, this is where cussing came from. That's why you can't tell me I can't cuss people out. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Through stammering lips and another tongue. The Bible say Peter cursed and said, no, the blank I was not with him. And she said, Banquisha said, no, I know you was. You know why? Peter frustrated and was like, why? She said this, your speech betrays you. H have you. Have you ever found eternal wisdom on somebody that should not know it? How does a, a little girl know how to say, I know who you are because of your sound? Something was in you. You talk like him. You walk like him. You use the same sentences and you can't get rid of him because he's in you. He was corrected by a child. What the lesson in that is don't think that because you, whatever you are, and that you know whoever you know, and that you can do whatever you can do, God will anoint a rooster. Balaam. You accurate prophet of God. You, you prophesy and you bless people come to you for holy oil and because we didn't find out that Balaam was a false prophet until the New Testament. That's why y'all like who y'all like. It took Jesus to tell us yeah, he was a false prophet, and not because I didn't call him, but because he wasn't like me. Because false prophets can give real words anyway. Um, Balaam had a reputation. He was spot on. He was bribed. And because he could hear, scream yeah, and because he was intuitive and could see, couldn't nobody tell him nothing. He had a know that I know that I know that I know in him. Because after all, he moved in the word of knowledge. <laughs> all of a sudden, God introduces Shrek. Balaam leaves the prayer room. He gets on his donkey, the biblical word for it is ass. And he touches the donkey. God touched the donkey. That means that God can talk to you through a jackass. He touched that donkey. And the donkey started talking to Balaam. That means if you're so stupid, you're so rebellious or proud that you won't hear from people, maybe God's got to talk through your puppet, your cat, your fish. I've got scripture for it. What makes me worship, though, Elder Moore, is that God will talk through whatever will listen to get you corrected. Because the Lord chastises who he loves. He corrects who he loves. He, he adjusts who he loves. And so, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Something is coming to America. 
I know we're excited about the housing market. <sighs> God's going to do some stuff with student loans, you know, some debts. But what I think is coming in 2021 is a revival of correction. I prophesy course correction in your life. That every lane and aisle and route and road that you've been on that's not the will of God for you. The love of God passionately pursues you to put you where you need to be, around who you need to be, with what you need to know. This is your season, of course, correction. And so what you didn't get it last year or the year before, so what you missed it in your 20s and in your 30s, but the hand of God is coming to America to bring her to course correction. The spirit of truth. Pentecost this year. It's not just going to be about tongues. It's going to be about awakening and enlightenment. Eyes open, ears hearing, knowing the way that we should go. Close your eyes for a minute. I want to pray for you. Father, in the glorious name of your Son, Jesus, we present our hearts to you now. You're worthy of them. And we know, Lord God, what it is to give our hearts to different stuff. We know what it is to close our hearts. We know what it is to hide it and to try to protect it. But this morning, we make an unusual offering. We present our hearts to you. And we say that in any area of our lives where we've rejected your wisdom, either consciously or subconsciously, we have a brand new reception. Father, make us more open than we, oh yeah, that's God. Make us more open than we've ever been before to what you want for our lives, our careers, our relationships, our talents, our gifts, our skills, our families, our conversations, our relationships, our potential, our money, our resources, our sons, our daughters, our ministries, our businesses, whatever you want. We are so open because there is a people that's tired of doing it their own way. Now, Lord, like you do sons, like you do daughters, like you treat heirs, those that are on the ascent to a throne, give us your wisdom. And, and, and when it lands in our soul, we won't reject it. We'll be wise. We'll receive it. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a moment. Close your eyes for a minute. I'm going to challenge you to do what David did. After he was corrected, he didn't bury himself in self-pity and he didn't wallow in regret. He worshipped. He worshipped. How 
Stand up and worship with me. If you love the Lord for not giving you what you deserved or for stopping your consequences, just lift your hands and worship Him for a minute, will you? If you're more open to wisdom and that is your real testimony, come on, spend some time in adoration with you. How great! Sing it out. Sing it out. How How great. Sing your own song. Everybody's ad living right now. Come on. Come on, make it real big. Put some volume in the room. Come on. How great, how great is your love? Come on, worship him. It's the love of God. It's not his anger. It's not his wrath. It's not his punishment. Come on. How great is your Worship him. A little harder. I'm not to let you go. How great, how great is your love? I love your name, Jesus. How great, how great is Lifted up. Listen to this. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship his holy name. Sing like never, sing like never before. Oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship his. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, I'm gonna call up and worship His home. Sing like never, oh my soul, worship His home. Follow me. Holy Spirit rain like Seattle overtake my life like a flood like California shake <laughs> what's not like you I just want a heart like yours Come on, it's Holy Spirit rain like Seattle. Like Seattle. Overtake my life. Overtake my life like a flood. Like California, like California shake. What's not like you? What's not like you? Yeah, I 
just want a heart, a heart like yours. Come on, Holy Spirit, like Seattle, like Seattle, overtake my life like a flood, like a flood, like California, shake. Make it real big, come on. What's not like you? I just want a heart like We love your name. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We love your name. I'm just waiting for the real worshipers. We love, we love your name. We love, we love your name. Because of what you didn't allow in my life. We up in the room if you get it. Oh, how? Come on. Worship him. You're the beautiful one. We love. We love your name. Oh, we love your name. Oh, how we love your name, Jesus. You're the beautiful one. We love your name. Oh, we love your name. Oh, how we.
We're going to be dismissed. Let us sing songs to the glory of yes, the Lamb. Yes, sir. We will sing songs to the glory of the Lamb. Let us sing songs to the glory of the Lamb. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to let us sing songs, let us sing songs to the glory, to the glory of the Lamb. Let us sing songs, let us sing songs. That's what we're doing. We're not in concert, we're just let us sing songs. Let us sing songs to the glory, to the glory of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Right there. Hallelujah. It's hallelujah. Glory. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to the Lamb.
I'll do it on your own. Do it on your own. Make it personal. I can hear you. His glory is in the room. Come on, worship him. That ain't your air in your lungs as he is. Give it to him now. Father, we celebrate your love because that's what correction is. That's what adjustment is. You redirect us because you love us. You confront us because you love us. You don't do it to shame us or to embarrass us. You're not even trying to wound us. You're trying to heal us. Thank you for loving us we were deemed unlovable undesirable we were deemed unhealable but you love us because you set your love upon us you're going to do things in and through our lives that only love could do and we give you the praise for it and we give you the honor we're done I just want you to take about 10 seconds it listen I'm not in denial. I know I'm a hard person to love. If you know it's hard to love you and you've got just a look crazy in you, but the steadfast love of God has been in your direction, chasing you down, go ahead and shabak him for a minute, will you? Come on, for blocking every spare bullet, for stopping every car attack, for hindering every burger and every fire. Come on. You may not have the house you want, but you're not on the streets. You may not be in perfect health, but you're not in ICU. Come on, praise it. It's the love of God. Come on, go with me, church. It's the love of God. You've got work to do. But I'm gonna tell you something you nobody know, told you in a long time. The Lord loves you. Uh-oh. I'm I said the Lord loves you. Listen, with everything he knows about you, he loves you secrets and all, flaws and all, failures and all. He loves your fears and all. The Lord loves you. I said the Lord loves you. You don't even know how to sit in that. The Lord loves you. Satan hates you. But there's a God that loves you. I said the devil can't stand you. But the Lord loves you. And he loves you too much to leave you how you are. I said the Lord loves All right. Yeah! The Lord loves you. Sorry. About to get caught up. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. That's why you're breathing right now. He loves you. That's why you can put on your own clothes this morning. He loves you. That's why you went to bed and didn't have an aneurysm last night. He loves you. And you still got work to do. Hey, 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 hey. Life is not perfect, but the Lord loves me. I got haters and issues, but the Lord loves me. The Lord loves me. The Lord. Whoa, oh, wait a minute. Pastor John. I said, the Lord loves me. He loves you, Rekina. Paul said it like this What can separate me from the love of God? Neither height nor depth, angels or principality, things present or in the world to come. What shall be able to separate us 
What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, oh Lord. That's how I know you love me. You're not just with me, you're for me. There's a difference, baby. If God be for us, if God be for us, I could run smooth off. I said, if God be for us, who can stand against us? He loves you and he's not holding a grudge. If God would mark iniquity, who would stand? He loved. Okay, God bless you. <laughs> he loves you, Robin. He loves you. He has commanded his love toward us. I said he has commanded his love toward us. Why? Why? He said, I even I for my own sake will remember your sins no more. You ask him what's wrong with you? He said, I can't even remember. Because I love you. Lord have mercy. They won't help me, Richard. He loves me. He gave himself amnesia so that he couldn't hold a grudge against me. The Lord loves me. The Lord loves me. The Lord loves me. The Lord loves me. What manner of love is this that the Lord would lay down his life while I was in sin? If you settle in that, it's easy to follow him because he loves you. I say he loves you. Lord, have, somebody needs to sit in that for a minute. Whether you do the revival or not, whether you get ordained or not, whether you write the book or not, whether you trust him or not, the only reason we love him is because he first loved me. Yeah! The Lord loves me. The love of God. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said the love of God. We don't preach enough about it. The love of God. You've been busy performing, trying to convince him to love you. But from your mother's womb. Woo! Praise the Lord. You are. You are. If you let that hit your heart for real, it'll take off decades of condemnation, I'm telling you right now. Maybe the reason you're disobedient is because you don't believe he wants the best for you. Lift your hands and say, he loves me. Hi, come on, say, he loves me. God bless you. We're going home. Now, 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 I'm, now, I'm trying to make it through this. Jasmine. Now, now, I'm saying this for the room, but I deliberately want to say this to you. Now unto him. It used to be unto them, but now unto him who is able. Lord, I wish I had preached a time. I said, able. Lord, I feel my granddaddy in my belly. I said, he's able. Lord, have mercy. Even if he don't do it, it's not because he's not able. He's able. Now unto him that is able, watch me, baby, to keep you from falling and to present you. They will faultless. Without blemish, without shame, without regret, without embarrassment, and to present your faultless before the Lord with exceeding great joy. To Him be all blessing, honor, dominion, power, both now and forever. Everybody scream, so it is. 
Say, so it is. Say, so it is. God bless you.